Hello everyone and welcome to this slightly different kind of video. So recently I made a video about how to study if you struggle to focus. You can see the video just over here on my YouTube channel. And there I really spoke about some great study methods with a focus on how to memorize things. Because what I was really explaining is that there are two components to studying. One of them is understanding, the other one is memorization. So when you think about studying in terms of understanding, you probably think about math or physics. When you think about memorization, then your mind might go to, I don't know, history, geography, or anything that requires a lot of memorization. But the truth is, if you want to be really successful with studying, whatever you study has to include both of these components. Because if you study physics, obviously there's a lot of understanding involved, and that may actually take like 90% of your time. But at the same time, if you are not able to memorize all these things that you, you know, took you a long time to understand, it's kind of pointless because a few years later, if you haven't used it actively, and let's face it, most of the stuff you won't really use every single year, it kind of just disappears and fades away from your brain. And yes, it may be easier for you to kind of re-understand it or relearn it at some point, but if you don't use it actively, what is the point? So in my video, I really spoke about a software called Anki, which you can see here on the right side of the screen. And Anki is really great because it uses techniques such as active recall to help you memorize things. That is, you put some piece of information in there and it quizzes you every few days. And if you regularly know the answer, that is your brain actually memorized something, it will keep asking you the same questions fewer and fewer times, but it will still make sure that it always remains in your brain. There's a lot of videos out there that talk about how to use Anki, but they're all focused on just memorization, like learning languages, learning history, and I think that's quite easy to do with Anki, but I think it's super important to use this also for STEM. Let's say you want to study computer science, math, physics, chemistry, and very few people use this for these fields. And as a consequence, people who study STEM very often forget most of the stuff that they have learned, which is, you know, a pity because in the end of the day, you spend years studying that, but not actually be able to use that for the rest of your life. So in this video, I will show you how to use Anki for studying STEM. And this is also why I'm using a different format for this video. So normally I have everything scripted, but here I really want to give you a real life example of me actually studying a course from MIT. And um, the best way of showing you that is by actually just continuously filming myself. I have a screen recording here, I have an iPad if, you wanna, if I want to make notes. I'm going to show you how I actually study. So the course that I want to show you, you can see it over here, it's called Introduction to the Theory of Computation by Michael Sipser. So Michael Sipser is a professor here at MIT. You can also find the lectures online on YouTube on OCW, so MIT, by the way, if you don't know that, MIT has an amazing online library of pretty much every single class that is taught at MIT. They have a recording of it and they put it online. So as you can see, the first lecture actually has 134,000 views, which is pretty remarkable given that in the classroom we are only about 80 students in total. And yeah, it kind of makes me feel bad about having missed the very first lecture, knowing how many people actually wanted to watch this. So if you're really interested in this, you should maybe first watch the video about how to study if you struggle to focus. That is the video over here. It will just make it a bit easier to understand what I'm going to explain now. And also, if you're curious about the matter itself, you might actually want to have a look at the lecture itself on YouTube, but you don't have to. It's not a prerequisite. It might just make it a bit more natural for you after having seen the lecture, listened to the lecture to, to follow what I'm studying, but it's not a prerequisite. Also, it doesn't really matter what your background is because the point here is not to teach you about theory of computation. I mean, maybe if you study computer science, it's something relevant to you. If you study pretty much anything other than computer science and math, it probably doesn't really matter too much. Um, the point is more to show you how I study. Also, I should note that if my study method works for me. It doesn't mean it's perfect for you, but I really just want to explain to you how I use Anki for studying this specific subject. So without further ado, let's actually dive right into it. Michael Sipser, great professor at MIT. You can see the content of the whole lecture over here. I'm not going to go through the introduction. Um, this is mostly like some basics about some definitions, how to prove something. So like mathematical logic. Um, if you're in college, you've probably taken some analysis or some course where you needed to prove certain things, so you should be familiar with the concept of a proof. But again, for this video, it doesn't really matter because I'm not actually teaching you the subject. I'm teaching you how to study for it, or at least trying to. So we're going to start directly with part one. That is automata and languages, that is with regular languages. And yeah, let's dive right into it. I'm going to scroll a bit forward to find this. 
Quick interruption at this point, don't forget to like my video, giving it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and very importantly, turn on the notification bell, because YouTube recently changed the algorithm, so if you don't have the notifications on, even though you're subscribed after a few weeks or month, months, it will simply stop recommending you my videos. So make sure to do that, and with that, let's get back to the video. Here we go, so regular languages. You can maybe also download the PDF of a book if you wanna follow really what I'm doing. As you can see over here, I have my Anki open. I'm just gonna click on theory of computation. This is completely empty because, well, I haven't studied anything yet. And whenever I wanna add a new card to my deck, it's pretty easy. I can just add something here. That's the front. The front is just the question that you're being asked. So if you, I don't know, study history, for example, this is where you would type in um, which year did the Second World War end? And then the answer would be 1945. And you know, if you keep getting that right, it will ask you that fewer and fewer times over the future, but the point is that you can memorize that for life. Here it's a bit more different because the things that you should memorize are not as obvious because I mean, just memorizing, I mean, you're not trying to learn a book by heart, obviously. This is like a kind of a math slash computer science course. Um, but it's still important that the things that once you understand these concepts, that you put them or store them in your brain in a way that you can always access it very easily. So you can read this with me, obviously. I'm gonna to explain to you what I really remember from the lecture um, in a simplified way, because otherwise it would be a bit weird to do this. So finite automata is kind of a weird abstract concept. So you can see it over here, this little um, figure. It's essentially some kind of machine. And again, I'm not lecturing you as an expert here. I'm just studying this myself. Some kind of a machine that can take an input. And that input can be, in this particular case, it can be a bunch of zeros and ones. And the machine, once it's done running, and think about it as a program, it either accepts or rejects. So it's kind of a yes or no question. And the way it works is as follows. So you give this machine some kind of input string, and that input string, let's say, it starts over here with Q1. So Q are the states of, of, I, of this machine. You have Q1, Q2, Q3, and the ones that have like this double circle around them, these are the accept states. So if the machine, you know, it kind of jumps around between these states, if the machine ends up in, in an accept state, that is in Q2 in this case, then it will accept. So if I give an input string that is, for example, just one, zero, zero, what does it do? So it starts over here where the arrow comes in to Q1. Then I said a one, so there's a one going over here. We have a transition to Q2. Then I said there's a zero, so we go to Q3, which is a reject state. But then there's another, what did I say? There's zero, one, doesn't really matter in this case. I think it was a one. We'll just hop right back here. So one, zero, one ends up in Q2. That is an accepting string. But on the other hand, if I, for example, give you the string zero, zero, one, zero, it will be a rejecting string because it comes in here then we have a zero, it hops right back at Q1, so it actually stays there. Zero, one goes to Q2, and then another zero follows, which goes to Q3. So that would be an example of a rejecting string. So there's like a set of, of these different strings that this machine accepts, which probably isn't the most accurate way of formulating it, but it doesn't really matter. So what we're really interested in, or the way I would now approach this is, you know, I'm gonna read through this, I already listened to the lecture, and I just, you know, want to make sure that I understand the concept, at least roughly. Obviously, I have to solve a lot of problems here to like understand it in practice or to know how to use it. But here, this initial goal, whenever I study these things, is just reading through it and trying to explain these things to myself. That is super important. So once I'm able to explain it to myself or, well, even more convenient here to, to you guys, since you're all listening. But the thing is here, once I understood this, uh, you always have to go to the formal definition because in the end of the day, this is a course offered in the mathematics department, even though it's called theory of computation, it's a mathematical theory of computation. And um, you should always go to the definition in the end and then actually understand what a definition says and then try to memorize it. So here we have a definition of a finite automaton. So the finite automaton is that little device with the little states that I showed you before. So a finite automata is a five tuple consisting of these things, whatever that means. And then we have an explanation of these things. So Q is just all the states. That is all of these little circles over here. These are your Qs, Q1, Q2, Q3. Um, next we have Sigma, which is a finite set called the alphabet. Um, so the Sigmas are really just the letters that you have available for yourself. So in this case, it's just zeros and ones. 
but nobody says it has to be just zeros and ones. It can be anything. Even doing computer science, the computer always works with zeros and ones. I mean, that's how computers are designed. So this is actually the language of your computer. But in practice, for us humans, for example, we don't just think in terms of zeros and ones. We think in terms of, we have a whole alphabet available to us and even more stuff than that. Next up, we have the transition functions. By the way, if you're confused by the things that I'm saying, don't really worry too much about it. Your goal is just to, to see how I study and then I'm going to show you how to use Anki for this. And then you can apply the same principle to something that you're actually studying, which you know may be much easier or much harder than what I'm showing right now. And then, you know, with applying these same principles, I hope you will really be able to improve your study, study methods significantly. So we have these transition functions. These are just these little arrows that go around. Um, I'm going to show that over here again. Where was it again? Um, these arrows. So these are the transition functions. So if you're in Q1, one of the transition functions is just a zero, which goes back to it, and a one which goes over to Q2. This, these would be the transition functions. Um, we have a start state, that is the one on the very left where we begin the computation, and we have accept states. So in this case, it is Q2. Q2 is the accept state. There can be more than one accept state. Um, if there's more than one accept state, then we just have to end up in either of these accept states and the machine will overall accept the computation. It's a rather trivial, but somehow abstract concept. So since I saw this for the first time in this lecture, I actually found it quite difficult. So I'm a theoretical physicist by the training, got my master's degree in theoretical physics. All the kids who studied computer science before, for them this was trivial and kind of obvious, but if you see this for the very first time, as I have just a few days ago, um, this is kind of odd. So how do we use Anki here? After having understood all these things, the next step would be making sure that I actually remember these definitions. Because if I do not remember these definitions in the long term, I will kind of fail to understand what is really happening here. So what I would do here very easily, I would just take a screenshot of the definition right here. Then I can, it's going to be a bit awkward because I have a second screen. I can drag it in over here as the back. And then as the front of the card, the question that I will be asked or kind of the quiz that I'm having here is just, um, what is the definition of a finite automaton? question mark. It's, it's as easy as this. And I know the goal of mathematics isn't always to memorize these things. I mean, at the test or my exam that I will have isn't going to ask me, hey, can you write down the definition? In fact, I will even have the book with me during the exam or any kind of notes that I want to write. But the thing is, even though you'll always have access to the definition that you have here whenever you need it in your life, I mean, you can just Google for it, you will forget about its existence. Whenever you need such a concept or to understand such a concept in the future for whatever kind of either research you're doing or, or whatever you're working on, you will just completely forget that this exists. And, you know, you can't Google for something that you don't even think about as something that exists, right? So I can just hit add here, which I'm going to do right now. And already now I have this card as a quiz. So theory of computation, this is going to be a big chunk of you know cards that I will have in here in Anki. But so far, there's just one of them in here. When I press on study now, it will actually ask me exactly this question. So what is the definition of a finite automaton? So the way I would now do this is, um, since it's not like a simple answer, I would actually try to write this down. So I have my iPad over here. Um, I actually probably forgot most of it, but let me try to write it down. So it is some kind of machine that consists of a certain, what is it, a five tuple? So there's a set of the Qs. I think there was sigma, delta. Then there was um, something like Q accept maybe. And Q reject. And now the definitions of these things are number one. This is all the states. Q equals all the, st all the states. You know, while I'm writing this down, you know, I'm also trying to re-explain this to myself. So what are these states? These are like the Q1s, Q2, Q3, etc., etc. Then the second thing that we have here is the alphabet. So sigma is the alphabet. So that can be 0, 1, whatever. It can be also other things, you know. It doesn't just have to be 0 or 1s. It doesn't even have to be numbers or letters. It can be, you know, potatoes and bananas, whatever. 
The number three, we have the transition functions, the delta, which I wrote in an ugly way over here. So delta is transition functions. So the definition of a transition function, if I remember correctly, it contains the state that we are at right now. And then for depending on whether we whether the next letter is a zero or one, given a zero one alphabet, it tells us where to go. So that would be some kind of function on a field which gets like a state Q and it gets a letter from the alphabet. I don't know how to write that, let's just write alpha, that can be like a zero or one, and it sends us to a new state. Probably that's not the right way of writing it, but I think I get the point here. So number four, well, Q accept, that is just the accept state. I don't actually have to write it down. And number five is Q reject. Again, I'm not gonna write it down, but I know that these are the like non-double circle ones. And if a computation ends there, the whole machine rejects. Okay, so I've written this down. Now I'm gonna sh click on show the answer. Maybe I should have zoomed in here in a better way. Let me just extend that. There we go. So definition of a finite automaton is a five tuple. Okay, you got this right. There's Q, there's sigma, there's delta, which are the transition functions. Then there's, oh, okay, I actually got this a bit wrong here. So <laughs> Q0 is the start state. So what I wrote here is wrong. It has to contain information about where the computation actually starts. I forgot about this. And F is all the accept states. I wrote down in my definition Q reject, but it doesn't actually make sense because now that I think about it, Q reject is just all the states that are not accepting states. So I don't actually need this. So let me go back to my iPad, cross this out. We don't need Q reject. We need instead, we need Q start, which they call Q zero here. There's start state. And the rest is fine. So I made one little mistake. It's not a huge mistake, but I still fail to remember one little thing in the definition. So this is kind of a tough call here. Um, I wouldn't click on, I have four choices here, by the way. So if I say easy, that means it's just gonna ask me again in four days and then, you know, after maybe two weeks and one month and one year. Um, I wouldn't click on that because I kind of got it wrong. I mean, I, I did, I would say good because I had like just one small detail messed up but I didn't do like a perfect job. So I would just click here on good. And then 10 minutes later, it would ask me the same thing. So the reason why it's currently showing the exact same thing is simply because, well, there is nothing else in the, in the whole study deck. So I'm just gonna go back to normal view and I'm gonna continue. Because normally I wouldn't have started going through these things until I'm basically done studying. But here just for demonstrational purposes, I showed it earlier. Okay, so this is the definition of a finite automaton. Let's just continue. Um, we have some more examples here, some things that I might want to write down, might want to try to go through, and let's just see if we have some kind of other definitions. So first of all, yeah, we have the examples over here. I can think about these examples. I should try out some things, you know, write them down myself. Um, this may also be a good moment to go through some problems, which surely are going to come somewhere. But yeah, so far, I just want to go through these things and try to understand really what a finite automata is. Okay, we've arrived at something new. So a formal definition of a computation. Um, I don't actually know what a computation is. Um, I'm sure the professor mentioned it during the lecture, but I forgot really how it is defined. So let's read this. Okay, I think that makes sense. So we have arrived at a new concept here, which is called a regular language. So a regular language, if I understand this correctly, is a language this is a set of all the possible strings that this kind of finite automata accepts. So I'm gonna make a little drawing here. I hope I understand this correctly. Again, I'm not teaching here, so if I say something wrong, um, that's part of it, that's totally part of it. You can get things wrong all the time while you're studying, as long as you then learn to you know, understand what the difference is. So let's just draw some finite automata. I'm gonna make it very simple. Let's have one circle over here, another circle over here, Let's actually make this a double one. So I'm kind of making this up on the go. This here is Q1. 
this here is Q2. Let's say that the computation starts over here. And let's say we have this transition function for zero. And that can actually be it. Or is it actually valid? So I think I need a transition function for anything. This may actually be wrong what I'm writing here. So Q1 needs to have a direction to go for each computation. So let's just add another Q here. Call it Q3. And that is kind of the trash bin. Let's call it like this. So if there's a one, we just go directly to the trash bin. And from Q2, I'm also gonna add two transitions, zero or one to the trash bin. So what kind of strings does this actually accept? Let's think about it really carefully. Um, first of all, that could be an empty string. So if you don't give it anything, then it just starts in Q1 and doesn't go anywhere. But Q1 is not an accepting state. So let's just write down accepting or answers that can be accepted. So we can already rule out the empty string. It will not be accepted. You can cross that out. What about if you just give it a zero? And I'm just going, you know, through all the possibilities here. If you give it a zero, then we go from, we start in Q1, gonna mark it over here in a different color. We start in Q1, then we go through this line and we end up in Q2. Well, that is an accepting state. So zero is fine. I'm gonna mark this, let's say green. There we go. What about one? What happens if I give the machine a one? Well, I start in Q1, over here, let me mark that out again. Starting Q1, I go through the one transition, end up in Q3, and that's it. Well, that's in a re rejecting state because there's no double circle, so I can tell now confidence that the one isn't actually accepted. I'll just cross that out. What about zero one, for example? And what about one zero and zero zero one? We can just keep going here, basically. So for a zero one, we start in Q1, then we have a zero, which brings us to the accepting state, but then we have it followed by a one, and that one unfortunately brings us to Q3. So now we ended up in Q3. So that is not acceptable. Q3 is gonna be rejected. Let me just write that down here. So we ended up in Q3, here we ended up in Q2. With a zero, we ended up in Q, no, I actually got it wrong. With the one we ended up in Q3, I think. There we go, fixed it. What about one zero? I mean, we could go on and on and on. I just wanna show you that essentially nothing else will get accepted here, I believe. So the one zero, again, it starts here, then there's a one, but a one kind of stays here. So I think this is something I did wrong. I should have actually added the following arrow over here, which says zero one. That means when we are in Q3, there also has to be some escape possibility but it's not really there because when you have a zero or a one added to anything, then our finite automata is just gonna start looping around here in circles. So we don't really get anywhere. In other words, one zero is not accepted because we end up in three. And now you will see that whatever I add here, I will really never ever get a string that is accepted by this finite automata. And that's what this definition of a regular language is. So a regular language in this case is really just our zero over here, the one that I marked here, as you can see. So the regular language of this particular finite automata that we have here, if I understand this correctly, is just a zero. I can't really think of any other string that would be accepted. So regular language. So the regular language of the above finite automata is just the zero. So I'm gonna make a, this has to be a set, obviously. It's just a zero and that's it. This is kind of a boring language, but there exists much different finite automata that might accept even longer strings, I think, if I remember correctly, because I saw something like that by the professor. So let's just use Anki here again. We have the definition. I'm gonna take a screenshot, um, click on add. I'll drag the screenshot from my other screen. It's a bit awkward in here. And just going to type in what is the def or definition of a regular language. It's a bit awkward to type 
on one computer that's here, but then see everything on another screen. Definition of a regular language. I'll hit add. Perfect. So I'm back to the book. Designing finite automata. I mean, these are all good examples. Um, this is something I would read normally through, but I'm going to just skip ahead because it's probably not very interesting for you to watch me read these things. Um, because I, I feel like I understood most of these things during the lecture already. At least this first lecture is kind of easy. But here we get to something more interesting. Operations of regular languages. So what does it actually mean? I, I followed that during the lecture, but I got a bit confused what this actually means. So let's actually read this together and figure it out. So in arithmetic, we have some basic operations such as plus, multiplication, but we also have something called regular operations. So let's find out what regular operations are. First of all, this is something that I surely will want to add to Anki. Let's actually do that right now already, because I know I will want to add this definition. But what is the question for it? <laughs> so let A and B be languages. So again, I have to remind myself, so language is the thing that I had before, like the, all of the accepted strings. So in the case of the example that I just gave, the language of that finite automata would just be a zero but it can also be something much longer or it can be even infinitely long. So A and B are, are sets of strings that are accepted by their corresponding finite automata. So we define regular operations, union, concatenation, and star as follows. So union would be, would be all the, what is X? All is, X must be the strings that they're either accepted by A or accepted in B. I think that's what it means. So it's essentially we have two finite automata and the union of A and B just means all the strings that are accepted by one, at least one of these two, possibly both. Okay, that makes sense. Concatenation is just if we put them one after another. So A is a little circle. B is just a string X, Y where X is from A and Y is from B. So, okay, that means if we have two of these machines, the concatenation just means it's a string that consists of a fir first part that is called X here, which is accepted by the first machine, and Y is accepted by the second machine. So let's make a little drawing of this. So let's just say I have, say I have a first box. I'm gonna, oh wow. I guess it's a circle. Let me let me try to draw this again. I think my hand drawing is so terrible that uh, my iPad doesn't really interpret a box as a box anymore. I'm gonna put the finite automata into boxes. Let's just say I have some kind of finite automata here um, with some functions in between. I'm not gonna add anything concrete because this is just for illustration. And then have another box. I'm gonna make sure this actually looks like a box with some other finite automata. Let's do it like this, for example. And there are some transition functions everywhere. I'm just going to randomly add them. So this looks like something. Maybe some self loops. It doesn't really matter. This is just for illustration. The start state is over here. So X is the input for A. Just name this A. And for B, the input is Y. So X is any kind of string that starts over here and eventually makes its way over here. And it can also oscillate around or move around, but it has to end up in an accepting state. And the same thing is true for Y. It may start over here, it may go over here, but eventually it has to make its way to the accepting state and it has to stop there. That is important. And now A concatenation with B is just, well, the X and Y well, a set of X and Y's that are accepted by both. Well, I'm not gonna write down, actually I can write down the definition. So X is an A. This is also something that helps me personally. Just reading a definition is fine and I feel like I understand it, but then actually writing it down makes it a bit easier to really, to get the point of it. So X is an A and Y is an B. Because often there's some small parts of a definition which 
I don't really think about, but once I write them down, I'm like, hey, why is that actually the case? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I understood union. I think I understood concatenation. Now star is something I actually found a bit absurd during the lecture, so let's try to understand this together. So what is a star operation? Star operation of a star is, okay, x1, x2, up to xk, for k being some non-zero positive integer, and for each xi is an a. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, I think I may have an idea. Let's go back to our drawing board just to understand this. So let's just say I have some kind of machine. I'm gonna, what should the machine be? The machine, let's just take the previous one that may be a bit too simple. Let's just go with a, with a cooler machine. So my machine is gonna start here. Let me make a nice circle so this looks like I'm not a complete amateur on YouTube. We start with the Q1. That should be our input state. Then I'm gonna add an accept state over here. Luckily I'm not teaching drawing, I'm teaching whatever that is. <laughs> this should be our Q2. And um, let me add another Q3. I don't know if I'm making this unnecessarily complicated, but I'm not able to understand this. So if I come up with a concrete example and manage to explain to myself what a star, like a star means, then hopefully I will be able to understand it. Also, these are all different size circles. That doesn't actually mean anything. I'm, I think that doesn't matter at all. So, and let's add a Q4 here, which should be a reject state. So I'm gonna make up something. We have a zero transition over here. We have a one transition over here. Then we have zero and one both going here. And we have, let's add a zero over here and the self-looping one. Because these self-looping things are really interesting. You're gonna see in a moment why I think they're interesting. And I also need to have something for Q4. So let's just add a self-looping zero and a one. This is supposed to be a comma, by the way. Comma one. Okay, so what does this machine accept? First of all, let's call this machine A. Oh, that's ugly. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so what does A accept? Um, well, it doesn't accept the empty string. I'm just gonna write down a lot of possibilities here. And then we're just gonna try to under just to recognize the pattern. This is always good. Like, if I don't fully understand what it does, I'm, I'm gonna try out different possibilities and I'll try to recognize the pattern. It's one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. Actually, I forgot to add zero, zero, zero. It's not very logical what I'm doing here. Um, I also forgot to add zero, zero. Actually, I should have tested that before. Um, see, these are little mistakes that you can easily make. And it goes on and on and on. But let's just try. So the empty string is not accepted because the empty string just starts with Q1 and gets rejected. Then having a zero, well, a zero goes from, from one Q1 to Q2. So that one is accepted. Just mark it. A one is not accepted because the one just goes from Q1 to Q4. So let's forget about that. Um, zero, zero is also accepted because it starts here, it hops over to Q2 and then hops over to Q3, which is acceptable. We like zero, zero. Zero, one, same thing. It hops from Q1 to Q2 to Q3 and gets accepted. So let's also add that. One zero is not accepted. So one zero goes from Q1 down to Q4. And then the zero just loops it right back into Q4. So this is not accepted. So now I could go on and on with this, but I think I recognize a pattern. So bear with me for a moment. This could actually be wrong what I'm saying here. So the zero is obviously accepted. And it's, yeah, the string is, is only a zero then a zero followed by zero or one is accepted. But then we have the self-looping thing, and I think this is not the interesting part. The self-looping thing means that if I have a string, so let's just write accepted strings. So accepted strings, there's two possibilities. Anything that starts with a zero 
or actually just a zero, then zero followed by a zero, and lastly zero followed by a one. So these ones are acceptable because the first one, the zero, just stops in Q2. Let me write that somewhere. So this one ends up in Q2. Tiny letters. But zero, zero, and zero, one, they go from Q1 to Q2 to Q3. So these, both of them, or should I write it down, they end up in Q3. And write Q3 for this one and for, for that one. But now the interesting thing is the Q3 itself loop. So if we have a one, as you can see over here, um, it seems like we can add as many ones as we want to. So that means I can, I can add a one here. Well, I don't have to add a one, but I can add a one. So let's just write 001, 0011, 0011. And you know, I can add as many ones as I want. The same thing down here. So if you have a 0, 01, I can also add a 011, 011, 011, 0111, etc. So this is really interesting. So all accepted states seem to be of that form. Because if we have anything else, we will eventually end up in Q4, that is down here. And Q4 is a dead end. Because once you're in Q4, whatever you add, you're just going to loop back into Q4 and there's just no way, no way out. And now the question is, I still haven't answered to myself or explained to myself what a star operation is. So star operation, now I understand it, I think. So a star operation is just a collection of however many possible true solutions we want to have. This is really counterintuitive. So let me just stick them one after another. So let me write that in a better way over here so you can still see this. So what is a star over here? Um, it's kind of weird what I wrote here because I wrote it A is the finite automata of the machine, but A is also the regular language. Maybe I shouldn't have used the same symbol for this, but let's just call it A. So A star can be a lot of things, I think, here. So I think all of these... I'm going to mark them. All of these here, these are possible solutions of A. So A star would just be a set where stick together as many of these solutions as they want to. So let's just pick a zero, and let's pick this guy, and then let's pick this guy. So we have zero followed by zero, zero, one, one followed by 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So that would be a possible element of 0 star. But it doesn't have to be that many. It can also just be the 0 from the beginning alone. Oh, yeah, you know what? Interestingly, it also says, it says k is greater or equal than 0. Look at this over here. So that means we can just have nothing. So that means we can also have an empty string. Even though an empty string is not accepted. Okay, this is very interesting. Um, I'm diving into a lot of details here, obviously it doesn't really matter too much, but I think I've understood now what a star is. So a star is just, we take all possible solutions or all, this, all the strings that a finite automata accepts, and we can just put together as many of them want as we want, including like none of them or all of them, or just you know, make a whole bunch. So this is a star operation. This is very, I still find it counterintuitive, but I think with some more exercises and practice, I will be able to understand this. So that's just, finish our Anki card here. So definition of union concatenation, concatenation, did I misspell that? And star for, what is that, for a regular language. Okay, so this would be a new card that I can add over here. Beautiful. Whew, okay, I think I've understood this. So let's move on. Um, oh yeah, here's some examples. I think this is always great to just look into the examples. Um, let's just read that real quick. So an alphabet sigma can be 26 letters A to Z and A can be good and bad. So we have some kind of machine that accepts an input string G O O D or B A D. I mean, the words don't really mean anything to that machine. It just happens to accept that collection. 
So A union B is just, oh, I see. So machine A accepts this. Machine B accepts just this. So the union is just any of these strings that are either in A or in B. The concatenation, okay, then now that makes a lot of sense. It's just we take an, the first part is something accepted by A, which is good, and boy is accepted by B. And then we can just glue them together in whichever way we want. So we have four possibilities. And A star is just all the strings from A put together in however many ways we want. So yeah, I got this right. When K is zero, remember the definition? We have an empty string. Then we have just the good, bad, good, 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 bad. And we can just glue these little bits and pieces together. Okay, I think now it makes more and more sense what, what the star operation means. <laughs> At this point, let's take a one minute break for a word from our sponsor. Speaking of learning, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who wants to acquire some new skills or just learn something new in general. You can invest into yourself and your own personal growth, so if there is a specific skill that you're trying to learn, Skillshare is the perfect place to get started with. So from web development, coding, over finances, and even to all kinds of arts and uh, creative classes, you can basically find anything that you might be looking for. When I started my YouTube journey, I had absolutely no clue what I was doing, so Skillshare really helped me because I took Ali Abdal YouTube for beginners class. There he went through all the different concepts of you know what kind of equipment to buy, how to talk confidently to a camera, which I personally found very hard at the beginning. And after just six months, I think it's worked really well, partially also just because I learned so much from this course. The first 1,000 people who sign up to Skillshare using my affiliate link down below in the description will get a one month free trial. And who knows, by the time you're watching this, I might even have my own course in Skillshare. Thank you so much Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And with that, let's get back to the main video. So we have a theorem here. The class of regular languages is closed under union. Oh, I see. So now the next part of this um, class, since it's, uh, since it's not a computer science, but a math class, is we just want to have a lot of proofs of stuff. Um, okay, that makes sense. And this is very pedagogical because instead of just giving a very mathematical proof, we have, um, we have an idea of the proof. So I'm actually going to read this. You can read it for yourself if you want to, or just skip ahead. Okay, and this is not followed by the actual proof. So the actual proof is usually very mathematical. So this is like mathematically rigorous and exact, but for a human who doesn't really understand the idea behind the proof, it may be difficult to grasp it. So that's why there's like a little explanation of it. And this proof is a bit weird. I'm not gonna actually dive into it um, because it's a YouTube video. Otherwise I would actually go through it and I would write it down on my own just to understand every single part. Um, you can do this on your own. I'm going to skip ahead and not do it. Now the question is, what would I do with Anki here? Um, I don't think it's really necessary to add a proof to Anki because you're kind of memorizing the solution steps of a proof, which during my undergrads, I actually had to do this because I had some exams where the professor would just say, okay, uh, theorem number 15.2.3, prove it. And then, you know, it would just be on if it was an oral exam, I would stand at the blackboard, I would have to write down what the theorem says, and I would actually have to prove it. And with so many theorems, I mean, the only way to do it is if you kind of memorize the solution steps. It helps to understand the solution steps, otherwise you have to like memorize it like, you know, as if you were an actor in a movie. But I think in most good universities, um, which unfortunately my undergrad degree may not fully count towards it, um, you do not have to memorize theorems, but you, I would still go through them. So that will be my next step in this part of the studying. Um, there's obviously it continues on with, you know, the closed under concatenation and I don't know where star is, but probably the star is just a definition. So next up we have something called non-determinism. I remember that from the lecture, um, but I found it a bit weird. Let's try to figure out what that means. So non-determinism, that's like a machine that has different possibilities. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so non-deterministic machine, we can see the figure over here. Have a closer look at this. It says we have an input state, So, but one thing that is a bit different about it is that it has a one that transitions here, but it also has a one transition that just goes right back to it. So for the same letter, if our string that we feed into the machine starts with a one, we 
have two two directions we can go at. And I think that's what non-determinism really means here. It means we can we can choose one of them at random. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense because it's not a probab probabilistic class or um, statistics class, so we don't really do things with uncertainty, but let's try to understand this. Um, so non-deterministic machine has several choices. Um, okay, I think I understand it. So what it essentially means, you can see the figure here. So deterministic computation, well, it's just a straight line. You always have only one possibility and you will always end up somewhere where you either accept or reject. But here you kind of have a three. Oh, that makes sense now. So instead of randomly choosing something, we just think about, you know, there's this interesting theory of, uh, of how randomness exists in the universe. Um, it's probably not true and doesn't make any sense, but there's a many world theories. So whenever there's some random event that happens, uh, let's just call it, you know, tossing a coin, which can be either heads or tails, kind of the universe splits up into two possible universes and one of them it ends up being heads, the other one tails. Now I understand that tossing a coin is not actually random because you know it depends on how you throw it in the air. You could calculate how it rotates and where it's gonna land, but kind of the idea here is a bit similar. So we split up into multiple worlds. So whenever there's a there's a fork, whenever we can go either, you know, let's say the one in the example over here, I'm gonna scroll up again when we get a one here. We could go either to Q2 or we could loop back into Q1. So this is essentially what happens. We can go into Q2 or we can loop back into Q1. And um, so what does this mean? So we have multiple possibilities. And if I understood correctly, oh, this is beautiful. Here we have a nice illustration. Um, so what happens here? This is weird. Oh yeah, so if any of them end up in an accepting state, end up in a Q4, then we accept. Because on the left, I think we have the input string, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And then we just have all the possibilities. And if any, if there's any path that we could have taken that would have gotten us into an accept state, then we accept, even if some of the other paths would have actually ended up in a rejecting state. Okay, well, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, do we have a formal definition of this? So, oh wow, this is a lot of errors and a lot of stuff, but I think it makes sense. Um, what is this? DFA recognizing A. Ah, okay, so what he's essentially explaining to us here is that the DFA, which is, what does DFA actually mean? I'm not completely sure, but I think that's the non-probabilistic one where you just have like a straight line path. And the NFA is the one where you have like different forks. And you can convert any NFA into a DFA by just making it look, well, apparently very complicated. <laughs> So at this point, I think I would spend some time like analyzing this and like trying to actually understand it. I think that was not the point of this video to go really through this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to continue ahead and try to get to the definition. So we have a formal definition here. So now I'm assuming that I actually went through that and understood it, which by the way, I don't completely. Um, I have another definition of a non-deterministic finite automaton. Let's grab this definition. I'm going to already put it into Anki. But before I really add a question or anything, I'm just gonna try to really understand the definition here. So I'm going back to my iPad. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water first. I've been talking for an hour already. So what do I wanna do here? We have a definition of an NFA, non-deterministic finite automaton. For me, this currently looks like it's the exact same thing, but let's try to understand this. So it's a five tuple. Q sigma, delta Q0 and F. I'm gonna write that down. So number one is just Q, which is a set of final off states. So that would be like the Q1, Q2, etc. Okay, that's the same as with the DFA that we had before. Number two is an alphabet. Okay, that's also the same. That can be, you know, zero, one, boy, girl, whatever the stuff that we had before. Um, okay, number three, I think this is the big difference here. So this looks weird. Let's let's try to understand. So we have some kind of transition function that considers the state Q that we have times delta epsilon. So this is different because previously we had just times 
Q, no, sorry, times sigma. Because that meant whenever we are somewhere, let's say we are somewhere here, then in some kind of Q, let's call it Q1, then we have different options, but they all have only one direction. So if I'm in Q1, I'm here, and I get a zero, then I know I'm gonna get here. If I have, if I get a one instead, I know I'm gonna get here, but there's no way of ending up in the same thing. But here we add an epsilon. So what is sigma epsilon? Let's try to understand this. Sigma epsilon is obviously the, this is ugly, the zero and the one. And I think we just add an epsilon to it and that's basically it. So this is our alphabet plus the epsilon is not actually the letter epsilon, but I think it's just a blank space. I think that's what it means. So if you kind of have a piece of paper with a string, you know, the piece of paper would, could contain like a bunch of zeros and ones, or it could be just empty. And if I understood correctly during the lecture, the difference between an empty string and an empty set is kind of, an empty set is just not having anything, whereas having an empty string that is an epsilon, is like having a sheet of paper that has nothing on it. Um, I think that's the difference. Okay, but how does this help, help us? We have the arrow to p, q is a transition function. I don't really understand this, so before I add anything to Anki, I will try to really get to the bottom of this. So here p, q is called the power set of q. Okay, got this correct. Sigma epsilon is just our alphabet with an epsilon. But what is the p, q really? I don't really understand it at the moment, so let's read up to this and try to understand it. Um, maybe there's some explanation of it afterwards. Oh, okay, so this is an example, and I think it's always great to look at examples. If I don't understand the definition, even though technically the definition contains all the information that is needed to understand something, uh, I'm not a genius, and uh, just by looking at the definition, I'm not really able to to grasp the full concept. So. Okay, delta is is his functions here. So remember there's like this Q looking back at my iPad. There's this Q times sigma. So the Q just takes into account where we currently are. So we are moving around in a finite automata, like over here. The Q is just a says, okay, if you are in Q1, that means if you're here, then this is the road that you want to look at. And then depending on whether we get a zero or one or nothing as an input, we could do the following. So if you get a zero, we just loop back into one. So we are here, we have a zero, nothing happens. Okay, we're in Q1. But if you get a Q1, and now this is the difference between, now I understand it, between a non-deterministic finite automata and the DFA, which stands for deterministic finite automata, we have two possibilities. We can either go this path, and loop back into, into Q1, or we can just hop over here and get into Q2. So that's why there's Q1 and Q2. And epsilon, well, I don't really get what epsilon means yet. But that's what it means to have two, two possibilities. So let's try to understand what epsilon means, because it goes into an empty set here. I don't really know what it means. But I see for Q2, it doesn't go into an empty set. So let's try to grasp this. So if you are in Q2, that is, if we are here, we have the option of going, well, we don't really have any options. If we add a zero, we're obviously going to end up in Q3. So if we add a zero in this row, we end up in Q3. If we add a one, we don't end up anywhere. So I suppose if we add a one, that is just equivalent to ending up in a rejecting state that kind of stays there forever. And if we add an epsilon, so if there's nothing, we can end up in Q3 still. So I think what this really means is that at any point where we have an epsilon transition, which is kind of nothing, if you have a string that we're reading, we can just choose to hop over somewhere. So even if, I ha if I'm at Q2, so my, my string starts, let's say, with a 1, I end up in Q2, I can just, without having a 0, I can just hop over to Q3 if I want to. And that is, I think, where, the, where this, these forks occur, so these kind of parallel universes, let's call it. Um, I can have... I can either hop over to Q3 or I can choose not to do so. And then I have like these two possibilities. Oof, okay, I think it makes sense now. 
it's still a bit abstract to me, but okay. Let's go back to the iPad. So I'm writing this wrong thing here. So number four is just the start state, the Q0, well, that's totally fine. Or Q1, no, it's called Q1. This is the state over here where I get started. And number five is all the acceptance states. Okay, that's the same thing. So really the, I'm just gonna write it down. So really the difference that occurs is just over here. And that is this non-deterministic part. But what, what the professor, what Professor Sipser claimed in the class is really just that um, any non-deterministic finite automata can be replaced with a deterministic finite automata that is equivalent. So it essentially means that these things, that if you have one, it may look shorter, the non-deterministic one, we can convert it into a deterministic finite automata that does the exact same thing. It may look more complicated. And this is the example now, I think, that he gave before. Um, there we have a non-deterministic finite automata here. So A is a language consisting of strings over zero and one. And then we have in figure 132, we have the equivalent of it, but as a deterministic finite automata. As you can see, so here, you know, we have a one and a one transition, so two possibilities. But over here, we don't have multiple options. We only have, you know, if I'm anywhere, if I get a zero, I go here. If I get a one, I go over here. But there's no, like, possible different path. So the lower one over here is a DFA, deterministic finite automata, and the upper one is a non-deterministic finite automata. Okay, I think I understand the concept now. I don't yet understand how I would get, take the, the top one and convert it into a bottom one, but, you know, this is something that I would just try to, you know, draw for myself and read a bit in the book, but I'm not going to show it here. Whew. So, I guess we've understood this part. So, we're back to the formal definition. Well, I think now, now it makes sense. Not before, but now when I understand the formal definition, now is the right time to add it to Anki. Please don't be tempted to add definitions into Anki that you don't understand. Because the moment you add something into Anki that you do not understand, there's just no point in it. Because then you're literally just trying to memorize the words and letters that you can see here. And, you know, then, then you're kind of wasting your time. You have to make sure that you understand this. So this is why every single time I'm, you know, I add a definition over here, as you can see, um, but I haven't like added a question. So let me add the question now. And now that I understand this, I think I'm, I'm ready to add this to Anki. And next time I have to recite it, I'm just going to try to explain it to myself. So let's do that. Definition of a NFA. And I hit add. And let's actually study this. So. I think we really got quite far. I don't really want to go into more of these proofs. I see there's a lot of proofs and things which obviously are important to go through. But let's just say, okay, I'm done for studying today. I already studied. Well, I think the video has been going on for an hour. Let's get started with studying. I'm going to put away my iPad, which has been recording all of this. And I'm going to get ready to study. Actually, I need my iPad because I want to take notes. So what is the definition of a finite automaton? So I've already done this one before, so I'm just going to skip skip over it because I did it as an illustration. But now this is the interesting thing. So what is the definition of a regular language? So as always, the way I do this is I, I try to explain it to myself. I don't just write down the definition because I mean, I, I'm not trying to memorize the words and letters of the definition. I'm trying to memorize the understanding of it. This is very important. So the definition of a regular language is just a set of strings set of all strings that are accepted by a finite automata. So a language is called a regular language if some finite automata accepts it. I mean, I guess that means pretty much the same thing, right? I think this is good. I'm happy with that, so I would just say, well, good. And I'll see it again in 10 minutes, and then, you know, next time I'm probably going to see it in four days. Definition of union concatenation star for a regular language. So this is something I would really just write down. So let's go to my iPad and write it down. So union. Definition of a union, A union B, is just this. There we go. So this is the definition of a union. Then we have concatenation. 
A and a little circle B. This is just X, Y, where X is in A and Y is in B. Great. Okay, now we're getting to the star. So the star is, is weird. But I think I under, and this is important now, if I had not gone through the effort of understanding what the star means and you saw me struggling with it, I would, I mean, maybe I would be able to recite the definition, but it would be super hard because I would literally just memorizing something that I don't understand. You know, it's like, it's like trying to memorize, how much easier is it for you to memorize something in your native language? Um, you know, for example, if I want to memorize something in English, okay, it's not my native language, but I speak English. It's quite easy because I understand the meaning behind it. But if I had to memorize something in, in let's just say Spanish, which is which I don't really speak. I mean, I can understand some of it. I really have to memorize word by word because I'm not memorizing the meaning. I'm memorizing individual words, even letters, if I don't understand the word, and that is really hard. But here we go. I think I understand it. So a star is just x one x2 dot 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 until x k where k is greater or equal to zero because of the empty string and x i is just an a for every i yeah i guess this is correct maybe that's not the exact way of how it was written but let's reveal the answer i'm gonna make that a bit bigger so the union is, well, that's exactly what I wrote down. Concatenation is, well, exactly what I wrote down. And here, well, that's correct what I wrote. So each x, i is an a. So if you look at the iPad, I wrote for every, this is what for every means, x, i is an a. So that means it's equivalent. It doesn't matter that I didn't write it down like exactly the way it was written here. The meaning of it is exactly the same, and that is important. So I did a good job. I think I would actually even call it easy. And now the last thing that I have is a definition of an NFA, so let's do that. I know this was a tough one. And last time I got a DFA wrong, so let's see if I can get the NFA right now. So NFA is the following. Okay, got it. So Q, Delta, Sigma, Q1, and F. So it doesn't really matter if I get the letters exactly right. I, for a moment I was hesitating if the last one was an F or if it was a G or some other letter. It does not matter. It's important that now I can define these things. So I know what a Q is. It's a list of all states. You know what number two is? That's just the alphabet. And I think the alphabet needs to include the empty string. It doesn't really matter, but I know that there was an empty string, so I'll just include that, even though technically an empty string is nothing, so nothing is always part of everything some way. Now the transition function is the hard one. So remember the transition function is a function that takes the, the input state, the Q, but it also takes into account the alphabet, but now we have the epsilon added to it. And this now goes to what we call a power set of Q. So instead of just sending us to the next Q, it sends us to multiple options for Q. This is like the fork switch split up. Okay, I understand that. 4 is very easy, there's just a start state. And F is a set of all the accept states. So this is now the important thing that I forgot also last time. It's not just one state, it's all the accept states. So I highlighted the S over here because this is multiple things. So let me reveal the answer on the screen. Here we have a definition. Yes, so these are the exact same letters that I used. Again, it doesn't really matter, but it's just a bit easier. Q is a final set of states. Okay, sorry about this. There has been a short interruption because my camera overheated, but where I stopped was exactly here. So Q is a finite set. Maybe I should have said finite state. Uh, sorry, finite set. Doesn't really matter. I think the rest seems about right. I mean, that's exactly what I said. So um, I'm pretty happy with this. So I would just click on easy and I find my pointer, there we go. And while well, we've already had a definition of a regular language, it's um, just a language that is accepted by a finite automata. That is how it said it there. If some finite automata recognizes it, accepted and recognized, I guess that's the same thing. I'm not completely sure, but I'm just gonna click on easy. 
So that would be it. It says, congratulations, you finished your deck. This is how I would do one study session. So this kind of summarizes the whole thing very well. Um, I just finished one study session. It was almost a whole chapter. I didn't go all the way to the end because, well, we ain't got time for that. And I think um, the main takeaways here are the following. So understanding and memorization are really key components to successfully studying. As you may have seen now, I spend most of my time with the understanding part. You know, I read the, the textbook, which you have over here. Hopefully, maybe you've already, already downloaded it, but it doesn't really matter if you haven't. Um, and I just try to understand all these concepts. Very often, I just went on my iPad, as you can see over here, like all the notes that I took, I'm just scrolling through them. And um, these are mostly just notes where I try to explain stuff to myself. So in this case, I'm explaining it to you. You can have, I don't know, teddy bear or cat or dog or whoever you have around, just explain it to, to them. And this really helps you to, to study very well. So that is the understanding part. And once you've understand it, and only once you've understand it, you can move ahead and put definitions or key concepts into into Anki. So what I sometimes would do is I would even put an entire page, and this is not something I've shown here, but I would put an entire page, uh, for example, in physics into Anki. So in one example, I had to understand the model, the quantum model of a hydrogen atom. It's kind of a long derivation in several pages, and I actually popped the entire thing into Anki because it was part of my exam. So it was, I had in Croatia, where I studied before, where I started my undergrads, but dropped out. I uh, had to take oral exams where a professor would just ask me these things and say like, hey, can you do the entire derivation of the quantum model, the quantum mechanical model of a hydrogen atom on the blackboard in front of him? And so that's how I studied for the exam. I would literally put the whole thing in here. When I would do the whole derivation, you know, every time I would quiz myself with Anki, it would be, take me 10 minutes. I would write down all the key concepts on either a piece of paper or an iPad. It doesn't even matter. And then I would compare it to the answer that I have here and figure out whether or not it was roughly the same or it doesn't have to be the same, but I have to understand it. So this is the understanding part, the memorization part. Yes, as I just said, we go through it, we try to use Anki to, to really be very productive about the way we study. Now, every single day, I will go through Anki. This is not really a deck that I've used before, but normally there would be like a whole bunch of things from the lectures that I had before. So one month from now, when I open Anki in the morning or evening or whenever I do it, I will suddenly get all possible questions mixed together. Some of them will be from the first chapter, which I just went through, but some of them will also be from later chapters. And as I become better and better at memorizing these things, um, these cards that I memorized will just occur less and less frequently, which is good because obviously I don't want to waste a lot of time two years from now with these definitions, but it's important that I really sunk this into my knowledge that at any point in the future, I can just recall it within a split second. I have some cards that um, I've learned so many times and knew so many times that the next time they will occur is four years from now. And that's important. But after these four years, it's super important that I actually go through them because otherwise, sooner or later, I would forget them. But if after four years, I go through it once again, it may take another 10 years to come back, but I will basically have remembered it for my whole life. And this is super important. You want to graduate school in a way that you actually have all the knowledge and all the understanding with you. And you can actually memorize this for the future and really use this in the most productive and efficient way possible. That is the idea of everything that you learn in school. So I hope you really learned a lot. Um, if you're curious about some other videos, I made a great video about problem solving strategies that you can watch over here. I made a video about how to understand math intuitively that you can watch over here. And I made a video about all the math skills that are actually relevant for your life, as opposed to all the math skills that you learn in school that may not be super useful. You can watch it over here. Don't forget to like my video, subscribe to the channel, and again, turn on the notification bell. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.